Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our last seminar in 2023. Um, today, we have uh, the pleasure to have uh, Yusun Chang from Indiana University as a guest speaker, and um, Mikel Plabol Moller from Princeton as a guest panelist. Um, if you have questions during uh, the talk, please un unmute yourself or write in the chat. Uh, the question, and we will uh, read it for you. Um, the floor is yours, Yusun. Uh, hi, Adriana. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, it is really a pleasure to present my work on this uh, climate change. So this is joint work with the, the Zag Miller and June Park. Oh. So I think... Uh, uh, since this uh, Nordwas's uh, lecture and global warming and, and climate change has become very important research topic. So you are quote what is said, the global warming begins and ends with human activities. So in our work, uh, we're trying to cover this, uh, the range from beginning to end. So the economic activity drives emissions and then emissions and their accumulations influence the climate systems. And then the climate system, finally, it has economic costs. So we, we care about this issue and we are trying to uh, address these uh, issues uh, in, in the paper. Hopefully the methodology we use here help us learn from the data uh, to, to learn more about these important issues. Um, this picture, uh, energy budget, uh, which, which I find really cool picture. Uh, this really indicates how complicated our climate system is. So you can see the energy coming in from the sun and then the, it is part of it is reflected from clouds and from the surface, but part of it is absorbed. And also there is uh, evaporation from the oceans and uh, they are absorbed by atmospheres and the some create heats and the greenhouse gases, you know, all these things create heat and how it is, uh, it is going to affect the cl uh, global warming um, is not so clear, but we're going to give some structure of this so that we can have some, you know, we can learn more about, especially about what we do, the anthropogenic, uh, part, we, our activities to produce energies and also the purely natural variations we are getting from the suns. So, so um, with that in mind, um, I can briefly talk about the methodological motivations uh, for using vectoral regression in particular. And vectoral regression is a uh, workforce in the empirical macro, and we are very familiar with it, but it is not quite popular uh, in climate, um, uh, climate studies. But obviously we like it because it's flexible. It, it, it helps us understand the feedback. And here our stance is that climate change is not exogenous, at least it's not entirely exogenous. So it's going to be a part of a VAR system. And also, through if we work in the VAR system, we can now think about studying effects of specific shocks on specific series. So we, we can have, when I say specific series, we can have a global economic activities or climate forcing variables, things like that. So that we can think about, uh, so here my our stance, as I said from the beginning, is that not all climate change is anthropogenic. So we're going to have some natural variations as well. And then we're going to, at the end of the day, try to you know, evaluate, quantify economic damages um, from these and uh, both anthropogenic and the natural variation sources. And in here, we are going to use the, not just the usual factor autoregression, but we're going to use what's called mixed autoregression, mainly because we want to allow for changes in, uh, in the global warming, not just by global mean temperature, but we like to see entire temperature anomaly distributions so that we have a much better understanding about influence of these climate forcings on not only the average, but 
also on the extreme temperatures like cold and the hot temperature as well as normal range temperatures uh, too. So I'll, I'll be more specific about how we may, how we define the, this new mixed autoregression. So, and also we know that we love this vector autoregression because it is simple. And um, although it gives us those flexibility, it is very simple and we can identify um, the model, which help us interpret the results based on some plausible assumptions, uh, which I will walk you through because we're going to be defining some new shots uh, uh, in driving this system. So uh, this is at the, end of, at the end of the day, it's going to be um, estimation of systems of equation for which we need to provide some identifying restrictions. And um, I will work with you, as I said, the assumptions we make to identify those um, the shocks here driving this um, climate economic system. So uh, this simplicity, simplicity is a big deal because the models that are commonly used in climate, like integrated assessment model uh, and the global climate models are known to be very large and com uh, complex. So uh, although they have their own advantage, but we do know that the, the handicaps or shortcomings of this large scale models. So VARs are actually used in climate science but not much. And the references cited here are good examples. But structural VAR is even less used. And some of the examples are, we have some examples now, but they are rather recent. So this is structural VAR is rather new in this climate science and hopefully, but I do think this structural VAR is really what helps us understand the beginning, middle and end part of the climate change that Nordhaus mentioned in his speech. So uh, now moving on to this methodological aspects, uh, the new one. So this new uh, novelty is, was necessary because as I said, we want to use the whole entire temperature anomaly distribution. But uh, you know, studying the functional data analysis is not new. So, and that's been used in income inequality, you know, say inflation expectation disagreements, financial risk and so on. And those are used uh, in the literature in various ways. So the some people use just moments like mean and the variance and kurtosis and so on. Or some like us uh, use um, in the regression where the regressor, the covariates are functions. Like it could be whole income distribution or yield curve or the trajectory of parental income from the child's birth to when they go to college. There are various situations where using entire uh, trajectory or profile or distribution is useful. Uh, and also these are, and we also, uh, this paper is actually the, the theoretical foundation for the approach that I'm going to present, the which converts infinite dimensional functional autoregression, which is the you know, autoregressive process of functions like income distributions to a vectoral regression, which is our familiar finite dimensional vectors. And that can be applied to various uh, functional time series, as I said, the time series of expected inflation, which I did in this uh, paper, or combine them with other aggregate variable, which also is done by uh, Chang Chen and Frank Schorfeider's work and my earlier work in other uh, papers. So there are, uh, you know, functional advances in using functional data methods in these studies, and this paper is going to be uh, in along that uh, in that literature. So going a little bit further into the methodology, as I said, this is based on the theoretical work that I did with June and our, one of our students. So that sets the layout, the finite foundation for approximating infinite dimensional autoregression to the, the usual finite dimensional vectorial regression. And this paper is available as a working paper. If you're interested, let me know. We haven't posted it on our webpage yet. And these are the papers that you may want to look at. This is the paper on the intergenerational income mobility where we use entire parental income profile from the birth to when they go to 
kids go to college. And this paper is in the MBR working paper series. This is uh, written for the empirical applied or uh, micro people. So you may find it easier to read. And uh, the IMF working paper is on the expected inflation. That's also used the functional autoregression approximated by the finite order VAR. And I applied it to study um, the interaction between oil market, global oil market and stock return distribution. And uh, it's also available. And the, the last one is what actually I studied uh, uh, the 19, I mean, 2018, where after I visited New York Fed, where they are struggling to understand the impact of monetary policy on income inequality. So this is really what motivated me to extend our theory the first for uh, FAR to VAR to include aggregate variables so that we can study the effects of the usual aggregate macro shock like monetary policy and fiscal policy shock on the distribution. And in particular here, the, the income distribution because we're interested in inequality. Okay, with that uh, background, um, let me tell you then why using this functional approach is useful uh, especially the functional approach that we will be taking. So there are many, as I say, many other way of uh, um, using distribution and there are different approaches, but I will show you a little later that we, we came up with a framework where we can, um, we can uh, encompass the other functional approaches that are available as a special case of this general unified framework. So, but then the, our approach here will be Actually, as I said later, you know, if function is infinite dimensional, somehow we have to make it finite dimensional. And at the end of the day, it is, uh, it's going to be a choice what basis you're going to choose to approximate this uh, infinite dimensional function. So our approach is going to be um, an approach where we use as a basis to approximate these functions, the uh, functional principal components. Uh, which is nothing but eigenfunctions of the sample variance operator. I say it's an operator because it's a, a ver uh, variance of infinite dimensional functions. But once it's approximated, it's nothing but a larger dimensional variance. And you can do it since it's a larger dimensional, you can do principal components and you will be taking the, the leading components, the eigenfunction, cross, um, you know, associate with the largest eigenvalues. So basically that eigenfunction is going to serve as a basis to approximate functions. And I say the choice of this particular basis will be optimal um, in the sense that I will be more specific about later. So once you do this, because it's a principal component, it is really, it is best at capturing the variations in the given time series. Therefore it contains more information after approximation is done. And then because of that, it relates better with other variables that we think are important to study together. So it is very consistent with the central tenet of using VAR, where we include in a vector together those variables that we think are important. So if you think about very common monetary policy VAR, where we include outputs, inflation, and commodity price and federal funds rate, for instance, we have a reason why we want to consider them together because we think they are meaningfully related. In that sense, it is very important to include the approximate infinite dimensional function into something finite. By doing so, we'll be losing some information. You know, we have to, but we'll do so in a way that we lose least amount of information, which will in turn make at the end of the day, what we have for the function most relevant or most related meaningfully to other variables that we want to study together. So well, that's the important um, decision, uh, basis for making decision about what basis to choose. And then the once you do that, once you represent and the function, then you can do the VAR in the finite sense, then the we can do the analysis, but at the end, we can recover impulse responses that are also functions so that we can see how entire temperature distribution are pro you know, changing over time after the shock. Here, you can get a shock from the climate forcing variables such as greenhouse gases, and you wanna see how temperature dis uh, distribution as a whole 
respond at impact and how they respond dynamically over the horizons. So once you do that, then you can do the, what you usually would do, how the aggregate shock, here the aggregate shock will be the shock to global economic activities or shock to greenhouse gases or shock to temperature, how that changes. So it is going to be going much more beyond looking at just few moments of the distribution like mean or the volatility. We're talking about the entire distribution. So you can say much more about the, what features of the, depending on what features of the distribution that you want to look at. If you're interested in looking at extreme temperature, very hot or very cold, that can be done uh, very uh, efficiently here. And moreover, we can go beyond and talk about and identify this. You will need to make additional identifying assumption to identify the shock, distributional shock. So we're going to be, you can talk about the shock that will change the temperature distribution and how you will define will be depending on your interests. So I'm going to hear in this example paper, we consider one shock, uh, which is going to have a worst possible out consequence on output in 2100. And this is the year the climate scientists, uh, it's a kind of benchmark year when they do counterfactuals. So we're gonna do also set our goal at 2100. We'd like to see, since we are economists, we'd like to see what kind of changes in the temperature distribution now will have a worst consequence on output in 2000. That's gonna serve as this additional identification assumption for me to identify this distribution or shock. And I'm going to call as a output minimizing blue shock. So, so I will tell you why I want to call this blue, uh, but it's going to be output minimizing blue shock. And this is, and then um, once we have a shock, we can see the impact of this shock on the aggregates and as well as temperature distributions. So, I think this with this new approach, we can get more empirical results, which you cannot find if you stick to the usual aggregate um, VAR, where you may put the average global average temperature. So you will, because we have entire distribution, you can get more empirical results. And I, I hope this is this can serve as a, a empirical evidence that I mean, may discipline the structural models, the, especially the large scale structural models, um, we can use this evidence to validate those uh, structural, large scale structural models before they are used for policy implications. So I think uh, this is useful in that sense. Uh, so instead of simply matching few moments, we will ask them to do more to validate their models. So we may, so then at the end of the day for policy making, we may, um, have a better disciplined model to do policy simulations. And also, because our approach, as you will argue, is more efficient in terms of uh, not necessarily speed of computation, but in terms of precision, in terms of having less smaller variance of the uh, parameter estimate, it's going to um, help us solve and estimate the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models that are commonly used in macro. Um, so I think, um, especially when you have more than one functional variable, which is often the case in the uh, heterogeneous agent, new and uh, Hank models. So I think this potentially, I'm working on it. And I think this um, uh, will may serve as a very uh, nice alternative way to solve an estimate. Okay, so Peterson, this can, is- Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so your discussion so far has focused on the information loss in going from a full distribution to certain features of the distribution like moments. Mm -hmm. But my understanding is that sort of your analysis also involves another kind of information loss, which is that you actually up, up, observe panel data on global temperatures in different regions across time. And mm -hmm. what you then do to that data to get it into sort of a form where you observe a density is that you compute the cross-sectional density of temperatures at each point in time. Yes. So that actually sort of loses information about the specific geographical regions where you have sort of different evolutions of temperature over time, right? Yes. You're, you're sort of losing the panel that, that dimension. And so yes. I'm wondering like, how would you compare sort of what you're doing here where you lose that panel dimension to a different approach? It might be, might be to sort of 
use the full panel, specify something like a factual, like, like a factor model or a large Bayesian VR or something like that, and actually try to use the richness in the panel data directly and then do structural analysis on, on that kind of uh, model. Um, there is, uh, you know, your first point is right. We get this, uh, we treat this each time, the cross sections of data. So we don't, we don't track those locations. So we have a uh, repeated cross sections. So we lose those locations. So we are not, and in our studies, we have a whole temperature range of temperature. So we are not going to follow the Princeton every year, but we are going to track what we are tracking is the temperature. So the, I don't, I don't, I, although I cannot, so there are some places getting hotter and some places getting colder, vice versa. So what I care is uh, the concentration of uh, location frequencies at certain temperatures. So you're right. So if you're thinking about income distribution, I don't care about me. I cannot track whether somebody become rich at the same time, somebody, as long as the number of people becoming rich and the number of people Distinguish that. Same is true here. If we have a exactly same number of locations getting hotter and same place getting colder, I'm not going to be able to distinguish because uh, the location, as you said, because I don't track the panel locations. So uh, if there are so for our purpose, that's not a concern. But if uh, because we are just we just want to look at how these different shocks will change this distribution. But if you're interested in different things and particular reason getting hotter and colder, and this uh, this approach is not going to be suitable if you if that's what you want to study. But here in this approach, we're taking the global stance, aggregate stance, macro stance. So uh, as a big planner on Earth, I just like to see um, which are we overall, what's what's happening overall. Right, but sort of the original spatial information might be useful in actually interpreting different kinds of shocks, right? Um, right. So that's going to be a, if you are, if your question involves that, then the, we may have to try other ways. So this is, the, we are, we are, although I use micro, so I tried, I use the word disaggregate data, but if we want to tr be truthful about micro nature and track the individual units, then the, this is not the right approach. Did I answer your question, Mikhail? Okay. Yes. So uh, then the, let me move on, um, then be more specific about um, what uh, what we do. So basically, as Mik Mikhail uh, brought up, uh, we're going to obtain this global temperature anomaly distribution. We'll, we'll get the disaggregate data and estimate non-parametrically the distribution. So every year here, frequency is annual we'll have a temperature distribution and we're going to identify and estimate the, the functional principal components, which is going to be the eigenfunctions of the leading eigenvalues of this the sample variance operator. And then we can identify this uh, functional shock driving the, the time series of this temperature nominal distribution. And then the once you find this uh, basis, then I can get the loading uh, of which is nothing but inner product of the the basis I choose and the temperature distribution at each time. And then I'm gonna combine that. I'm gonna call that as a function of principal component loadings, which is nothing but time series. So if I pick uh, three leading principal components, then I'll have three time series of these loadings. And then I combine them with the global aggregates. Here, we're going to have global economic activities and uh, greenhouse gases and aerosols, those are two major climate forcings. And then we put them together in a vector. And then the, uh, we, so we have a three-dimensional block of aggregate variables and then these functional variables. And that will give us this uh, mixed autoregression, okay? And then the, we're going to identify three shocks. These are the three different shocks that will uh, create outputs for us. So there are three different types because of their characteristics. We're gonna have an anthropogenic output shock. And those are the shocks, uh, you know, greenhouse, and it, it's going to have a three different components, anthropogenic. One is the emission neutral, which I'm gonna call this a green. It's, it, it, it helps us produce things, but it doesn't affect the 
climate forcings, the emissions like uh, greenhouse gas, uh, CO2s and sulfur dioxide and so on. Another one is a carbon base. This is going to be, of course, help us produce things, but it's bad. It's brown, dirty chalk because it produces in particular carbon dioxide. And another chalk we separated to be sulfur, yellow chalk because the sulfur is yellow because it is also, it helps us produce uh, things because uh, when you have any plants with the coals and so on and oil, it's going to produce this. It's different from CO2 because it has a clearly negative uh, health consequences. And this is really, the sulfur dioxide is really what motivated us to have a Clean Air Act and other legislature, which puts restrictions on the emissions. So we separate those because it, it does have different policy implications. And, the, and then the, we have a natural variation shock. So we have a three shocks, which involves producing outputs. So we call this output shock, they all involve humans. So we call human anthropogenic output shock. And there are three different kinds, green, the good ones, and the brown, dirty brown shock, and the yellow, sulfur dioxide, which has clearly negative, bad health consequences, bad enough that the countries um, were you know, they have are forced to do something about it. Like Clean Air Act in US is very important example. And then the, we're going to study these dynamic interactions involving both distribution effects of these uh, aggregate shocks, this um, both anthropogenic and natural shock. And then we're going to also study later how this particular change in, again, this is, I'm taking this macro stance when this change in this uh, global temperature distribution, in particular in the way I define, which has most negative consequence on output in 2100, how that will affect both aggregate variables and the distribution. And I will show you counterfactual analysis on economic damage. We, we, love, we like to shut down some of the bad shocks and, and then that would allow us to find out what would have been the growth rate for us if we didn't have a uh, brown shock, for instance, this uh, dirty brown shock, for instance, what if we shut down this uh, natural temper temperature radiation shock, what if, what's going to be the consequences on the outputs, the growth? So those are the things that, this is, this kind of counterfactual analysis is typically done in macro, empirical macro, and we're going to try to do that. Uh, in this exercise in terms of computing economic damages and evaluating actual costs in dollar terms uh, in some hypothetical setup. So just to give you, before I move on to the methodologies, I just like to visualize what I've been telling you. I was telling you about this output minimizing shock. Um, then the, this is add impact. This is how we define this uh, distribution, temperature distribution shock to be. So if I have this, uh, uh, target that this shock, whatever that is, I'm looking for that shock that's going to give me the most negative consequence on output in 21. That's going to change the temperature distribution in this way. It, it lowers this uh, medium to below. So this is uh, 10 to, this is about 10 percentile, 10th percentile to 50th. It reduces those, and but it increases temperatures above 50th percentile. So certainly it's going to have a heating, warming up effect. And this is at impact one year later, two year later, five, six years later, and 12 year later. This is the shape of the shock. So you can visualize what, when if I say I'm giving this blue shock, why am blue shock, what is? That shock is the shock that will change the temperature distribution in this manner. It's going to push down. It's going to decrease colder temperature cooler temperature, but it increases uh, the hotter temperature. Okay, so the I know I'm going to be, uh, just in case I don't have enough time to cover everything, let me give you some uh, what extra things we were able to learn beyond and above the, what you could learn from the user aggregate VAR. So first of all, I can say, because I'm looking at entire time series of entire distribution, I can say that there are only three functional principle components that are important. They explain more than 90% of total variation over time. So you, if you look at these three factors, you are losing less than 2% of the information, but it gives a huge reduction in dimension from in, infinite dimensional to only three. So at the end of the day, that's a much bigger bargain than using any other choice of basis. 
this is, uh, I will show you, but this is a very, very important reduction. And this, um, in terms of actual findings, this uh, brown, dirty brown shark, I use color brown just to make that it is making things dirty. And it is anthropogenic because this is due to what we do. And this guy turned out to be most important historically. I will show you historical decomposition to show this. And it is the most important driver of uh, global warming. But the, the blue shark, it doesn't have that much obvious permanent effect. But I'm not saying that it doesn't have effect. It has effect, but they are very volatile. It doesn't accumulate very much. And um, green sharks, it doesn't affect climate change that much, uh, but it does. It, it does have. It's not as much as brown shark, but it does have, but in a way that is helpful to mitigate those warming effects. And the yellow sharks, the one that shark that involves health has health consequences. It is really nicely, once we identify and extract them, and I will show you the time series plot, it really nicely explains historical episodes, especially the policy, um, I mean, policy and events, especially those efforts. I mean, UK Royal Navy, Winston Churchill decided to use it from coal burning system to oil diesel that was large enough during the World War I that it actually showed some evidence. And also the Clean Air Act and other um, the amendments on Clean Air Act and in US and in other countries, some similar health policies, uh, you know, reducing sulfur dioxide emissions. And also uh, recently, more recently, the China, uh, just before the, the Beijing Olympic Games and other uh, sulfur dioxide uh, reduction policies in their economic plan 11th, the major changes. So that actually we show even in the global scale. I will show you that. And uh, this is a you know, an result from our counterfactual on economic damage. And if we didn't have the anthropogenic climate changes, then actually the per year growth rate could have been from the, uh, without any counterfactual exercise, it was 3.05 per year since 1975. But without this, if we can shut down these anthropogenic climate changes, it will be 3.3. .3. So there is a substantial gain. If we're talking about per year growth rate, so this is quite substantial. And uh, as I said, the damages from the climate changes are actually seriously underestimated uh, uh, if you use only the global mean temperature instead of using entire temperature. These are the findings. Hopefully you're curious enough to see how we got these results. So I'll move on to uh, show you uh, the methodology. But before I go do that, I will show you basically how I got these results that I summarized to you. The first of all, I did this uh, user in person responses, but as you can see, the last row is different uh, from the user impulse response table. So now the, we have the green shark, brown, each column show you the, the, the color, the different sharks we have, green sharks, brown sharks, yellow sharks, and the blue shark. This is output minimizing blue shark we identify. And their impacts on the aggregate variables are the user. The, this is just a function across the horizon at impact to the next 12 years, for instance. But the last one is the impulse response surface is not going to be aligned because at each horizon you have a whole uh, functional responses. So uh, the green shark, I mean, I don't know whether you can see it. I will show you two dimensional slides, but it can show that it is, uh, you know, increasing the temperatures in the lower side, but the brown shark is increasing temperature on the hotter side. This is a positive uh, increases. And the yellow shark looks more complicated, but it, at uh, the long enough time, it does have a warming effect. But this blue shark, by, oops, by definition, it's going to increase. The way we identify shark, it's going to increase the global temperature. So I know it is not easy. So uh, I am going to show you, oh, I don't know why this is going, okay. So I'm going to show you this uh, histogram. So which kind of summarizes so this is going to be like the temperature around 20s, 40s, 60s, 80s, and one. So from cold temperature to hot temperature, 
uh, in each block. And each one, the first one is the blue shark that we identified. So if you read this, this blue, so I have uh, each of these uh, temperature called, this is the bottom 20%. There you can see that at impact, it's a one year later, two year later, five year later, and 12 years later. So you can see that the, the impact of this blue shock in this cold temperature is it reduced the you know, frequency of this. So it's, gain, it's lowering the, the lower temperature, but it comes back. And after five years, the effect is not much. But if you look at this, uh, the, the about the middle temperature, it went up at the beginning, but it died out in five years. The effect dies out. And if you look at the next one, this is a green shark. It's going to affect big the, the temperature, the green shark. This is nice green shark. It really increases the, the lower temperature. But at impact, it's not much, but its uh, influence is going up and up. So it is uh, as it goes up, this green shark will have a positive effect on global warming because it increases cold temperature. But you can see that it, it is decreasing as it time goes by, as the horizon goes up, it, it decreases this hotter temperature. And the brown shark finally, this decreases cold temperature, but increases all other temperature. And this effect is uh, permanent. You can see that this effect is uh, uh, you know, not dying. And this yellow shark, Although it has a confusing effect at the beginning, uh, at the lower temperature, but clearly in the hotter temperature, it does have uh, warming effects. So this is uh, maybe so much to read, but you know, once you have this distributional effect, you may present the result whichever way that you think is easier to communicate. This may, may, may not be the best, but I thought this is one way to summarize the results in the, the, the spe space. Okay, then as I said, you can also do historical decomposition here. The brown shark, I mean, the brown, I use the same color code. The brown shark is important for explaining historical decomposition of output and greenhouse gases itself, and not so much on aerosols, which includes sulfur dioxide, but it also has a big impact on cold temperature. So I have a tenth, around 10th percentile of the cold and then about 50th percentile about normal range, and then hot temperature about 90. But you can see that this brown shark has, um, I mean, it helped to increase outputs, but it also increased this uh, hot temperature, oh my God. sorry, hot temperature. But it lowered the colder temperature and normal temperature, the brown shark, and its impact is getting larger. So in, its impact is getting um, more increasing, which is, uh, concerning, and you can see that this increase path pace of increasing is getting even bigger in recent years. But I what I like to draw your attention on this uh, um, green shot. Its impact is actually on output pretty positive throughout the history, and especially after World War II. So uh, and the and these shocks, the the color codes and the red one that I haven't explained, and we do have this external solar the shock from the solar activities and volcanic activity, which we treat as external shock. So this is kind of the big, the kind of analysis we did to, uh, uh, for the results that I summarized to you earlier. And you can, th this is um, in depth because we are interested in outputs. Okay, so this is influence of uh, the yellow and brown shocks, big time the um, green out, the, the brown shock, but the other effects. Okay, the counterfactual that I told you to get this uh, the output growth rate exercise. So the our counterfactual analysis is based on the two channels that we have the, on this uh, uh, brown shock, the anthropogenic, the shocks that the uh, damages that we are making through producing carbon and sulfur dioxide and so on. They have a direct and intended and direct channel which will spur our economic growth, but there is unintended and indirect effect through the global warming. So we're gonna have an effect on output through both direct and intended of these uh, shocks, brown and yellow shocks, and unintended shocks. So we are able to do this uh, once we do this structural VR analysis. So if you, the counterfactual here is the two scenarios where you shut down these uh, three output shocks, anthropogenic shocks, so that it doesn't affect climate change, then what 
what would be consequences on uh, the growth rate, which I told you about. Another exercise is we allow the climate, the natural temperature changes do not affect economy and what happens. Okay, So this is the number that I gave you. And if we shut down the carbon base, the CO2, that's when we get boost like 0.25% per year. But if you allow both brown and yellow, we get less because the obviously sulfur dioxide, part of this aerosol has a cooling effects because the sulfur dioxide become like a cloud and it reflects some of the sunlight. Okay, so uh, in terms of dollars, if you think about the 2000, according to World Bank, uh, we have a global GDP of 86, about 87 trillions. And uh, so if you can think about in some future year where we have a global GDP of $100 um, trillion, then uh, that means the, the economic growth, the cost of having uh, growth every year means it's going to be 3.3 trillion per year. Okay. Now, in this um, the dollar setup, then the, if we, you know, if we can, I mean, of course, our estimate is not most uh, accurate, but if you use our estimates, then this uh, carbon-based, CO2-based climate change you know, it's going to lower growth uh, from 3.3 trillion that we could possibly get by 250 billion a year. And the net will be 120 billion, for instance. And this is not based on, I want to say, uh, it is not based on the full case based on spe speculative exogenous emission or concentration pathways. So people usually have their expected uh, forecasts on this, but this is just uh, based on the, our estimate. Uh, and the costs based on this hypothetical year. Okay. You, you okay. Said, quick question about that calculation. So mm -hmm. um, I I thought that um, the variable in your model was real GDP, mm -hmm. right? So you're measuring the effects on real growth. Yeah. But here you're talking yes. about nominal variables. Yeah, so... I think this is a world World Bank measure is a real. I think so. Well, we are. That's why um, we're just using it. I think their their values are chained to certain years, so it is. Uh, you can interpret that as a, a real term. But that makes it difficult to interpret sort of the absolute le level of these numbers, no? Because it's not. I mean, it's sort of it's arbitrary what the, what the base year is and so on. So well, here we are saying that I'm just giving you a perspective where we are. Uh, in terms of this measure. And then the this hypothetical year in the future is some when we have 100 trillion. So it's going to be some year later. Yeah. And I'm just, I just wanted to give you some dollar number. Otherwise, yeah. it's not going to be. Yes. But I mean, nominal growth, presumably, <clears throat> sorry, nominal growth would be larger than 3.3%. Um, so, yeah, anyway, it is. Yeah. Just, just a question about real versus nominal. No, it's yeah, not. Yeah, it is, it is, it is real. So well, nominal, as you said, could be nominal gross rate will be different. Then that's going to be uh, even, yes. I mean, these forecasts are, so here we're just uh, taking just numbers. And what I provide is percentages based on the estimates and converting into dollars, you will have to do some more uh, conditioning. Okay, and the these results is about this, um, the in terms of the figure, so this uh, black line is what you're going to be getting. So this is, in, historically, we have this growth rate. And then the, we will have a new growth rate based on this hypothetical situation. And what I'm plotting is the difference between the, the counterfactual growth rate and the historically what we have. And this black line is what we would get if we shut down both the effect from the, the brown and the yellow shocks. All, but if we shut down only brown, then the, you're going to get this uh, brown color. And if we shut down only yellow, you will get this. So as I said, the brown shark has definitely a lot of warming effects. And the yellow shark, the carbon sulf um, the sulfur dioxide has a cooling effect. So in the end, the final will be the black one, which is in the middle, which is still substantial. And it is getting larger over recent years. Okay, and uh, the blue solid line is the difference. We are doing the same thing, historical and the counterfactual. And this is going to be 
So I think uh, what's different, what's most striking is that um, although these anthropogenic sharks are smaller in magnitude, but they are accumulating. But this uh, persistent, but this blue, effect of blue shark, is, it's not. So on the average, they are very small because they are sometimes very positive, sometimes very negative. It's really, really volatile. So, so on the average, it's not going to be much. But so if you compare with these dotted lines, we have a black solid and black dotted and blue solid and blue dotted. Those are the, the dotted lines are what you would be getting from the usual structure of VR with the aggregate uh, temperature averages only. So you can see that they are, they are really dwarfing the variations in the, the effect of um, natural variations the volatility is really dwarfed. You can see that they are much smaller in both cases. And then sometimes this underestimates. See, um, you, you can see that this is uh, it's going up, especially in recent years, this economic damage is going up in our studies, but it is not. So it is really underestimated, especially in this. So it really um, you know, misses all these variations and then the mis underrepresents the impact. Okay, so I know I spend a lot of time motivating and give you the results, but I will walk you through the models uh, very uh, quickly. So this is the formal model, climate economic economic uh, system. And we're gonna have these uh, four structural shocks <clears throat> uh, driving four endogenous variables in the system, which is output, global output, global greenhouse gas concentration, aerosols and land use, A, temperature anomaly. This one can be, in structural, it's going to be either mean temperature for conventional or whole distribution for hour. And then we're going to have a two external shocks from solar activity and the volcanic activities. We are going to say that, that there, there is no interaction, dynamic interactions, and both in the short run and long run. So we're going to treat this guy as a truly external shock. It's not in our system, but it affects as an external shock. And this is data sources. Uh, from 1980 to 2019. So we have a uh, very long 170 years of the data and the units are watts for the heat energy, the watts per square meters. Um, and these are uh, common units used because the, this is the energy balance model equates temperature changes to uh, the base period using their, the, with the forcing formula, this um, CO2 and sulfur dioxide in this. So we're gonna find and follow their convention and use these units. So the uh, I say this because it's uh, measured by heat, but then the aerosol sulfur dioxide it has a cooling effect. So the more pollution that we make through sulfur dioxide, there will be a cooling effect. So the, it it kind of complicates interpretation, but I will mention it again. And then there is a the reason we look at the output in log is because also in the tradition and the formula available in this. Uh, uh, literature, they link climate forcing variables like CO2s and sulfur dioxide, it outputs in log. So, so we follow this tradition, but that makes, uh, so that's why the, our data looks pretty persistent. I will tell you about how to deal with the persistence later, but this is in a nutshell, this is our graph. So this is output, this is um, greenhouse gases and the aerosols, and this is, I'm just plotting the average temperature, which shows clearly uh, upward path. And then this is um, a dotted red is a solar uh, activities and this is volcanic. And you can see that the volcanic, you see whenever we have a big eruptions, major eruptions in the history, you see it is going down. Um, it's um, because we are measuring them in the heat to the square meter at the watt. And then the, this is the time series from the 1980 to 2019. And we focus on the demand temperature distribution because we want to have uh, the function space, Hilbert space, uh, properly defined as a vector space. So we want to, we have to have, uh, you know, the vector space need to be closed under addition and uh, simple multiplication. So we cannot work with the regular usual density. So we take the demand so that we have a properly defined uh, Hilbert space as a vector in uh, space. And then this is a script plot. Oh, Yusun, can, can I ask yeah. about the, the temperature di di distribution? So you you sort of estimate this thing at each point in time where the kernel density exactly. estimate. 
Yes. And then you treat year. the density yeah. as known and observed without exactly. error. Exactly. And I guess yeah. my 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 question is about that. So so usually, like uh, unless the sample size is is huge, we would have pretty big standard errors for kernel density estimates. We um, have a huge uh, huge amount of data cross section. So uh, and we uh, expect it to be spatially correlated, and therefore the standard errors would be quite large in practice, or no? Actually, um, uh, we discussed it in our earlier paper. Actually, the estimation error coming from estimating the density. So as you say, I'm going to estimate and later or in my analysis, I'm going to pretend that I have a density that is known. Uh, as long as the number of disaggregate data, n, say, is large relative to the dimension time series, we show that this, this estimation error in this non-parameter estimation is negligible. So based on that, right. uh, just... So we're going to but, take but, it. But the, the, the higher the spatial correlation, the larger does the cross-sectional sample size need to be, I guess, right? So for, for it to be negligible. Yeah, um, and that analysis, we do allow for cross-sectional dependencies, although not excessively. So, but here we have a very, very large number of cross-sectional observation and I'm, our time period is only 170. In the stochastic order, uh, measure it is really negligible, so we take that right. stance. So it's a it's so, very important point you're bringing because some people, if you really care about this estimation error, then you may have to treat them accordingly, and that's what Frank Schulfeld and others treat this right. density as a latent variable, and they have to go through the state-based models uh, to predict and update and so on. Here we don't take that stance. Here we're going to take the stance that this can be accurately estimated and then take the demand so that we make sure they lives in a proper function space. One thing that's different from their approach to other people, they take this density or log density. They are not working in properly de defined the function space. So they are uh, they cannot use the, um, uh, there is a disadvantage. So because uh, once you have a uh, element, functional data object that that you can assume to live in nicely, like the Hilbert space with a square integral function, then there are a lot of results that are already established that we can use. So there is a distinction, whether you work with this or log, or the stance that you're taking about the, your the estimates of the density. So we're gonna take uh, the very, thank you for bringing that up. That's a that's very important stance that we take. And we think uh, in our situation, we're okay to assume that the estimation is done uh, precisely enough. But you could report the confidence band, right? And just sort of, I mean, at, at like various points in time and just sort of show us how, how big the standard you errors could. are. Mm -hmm. You could take one typical year and show that. You can, you can report those, yes. You can do those, uh, you know, non-asymptotic studies and show to what extent you have those. Yes, but we, we we did we have a much further discussion on this in our 2016 Journal of Econometrics paper, and we just argue in this paper that um, we have a substantially large number of cross-sectional observation each time. So we said the estimation error is negligible and move forward. And then the important step is to take the cross the overtime mean out so that these uh, functional objects are um, you know can live uh, in this uh, proper uh, function space here uh, square integral over space of uh, functions then um, we do in this space analysis and uh, we look at this uh, the sample variance operator which is uh, nothing but the sample variance uh, matrix. If you so heuristically think about uh, function space as a very, very large dimensional vector space, which under um, the usual assumption when the space is separable, you can always have, um, uh, you can have that as, uh, make that analogy being the function space as a very, very large dimensional vector space. So here, this is the, uh, the cumulative uh, script plot. And uh, you can see that uh, with uh, only three, I explain more than 98%. So you can do this by cross-validation, leave one out or leave three out, leave K4. I mean, there are many things you can do, even but eyeballing, you can see that this is really, but you, the more you include, this will tell us how many functional principal components to include. And this tells us three is enough. And that's where we go with it. 
And these are the three leading components. So these are the eigenfunctions, the three, which give us three major feature of the distribution that's uh, driving the changes over time. And each one will have different importance across time. So you can see that this guy, as I explained to you, this has the kind of uh, warming effects. So if you multiply and its influence is each time will be defined by these uh, loadings. So for instance, the maximum positive influence is about here. I don't know whether you see this little hand. Do you see my little hand? Yeah. Do you see it? So yes. uh, this one, we yeah, do, this, yes. yeah, this one times this is going to give us a red line. The red line here on the right hand side, this is going to be the impact, the maximum positive effect of this first factor onto the distribution. So this is going to make the blue, it was a historical average, it's going to become like this. So warming, shipping to the right. Whereas when you have a negative effect, it's going to be shipping to the right. So you can see that this impact of this warming uh, factor is increasing in recent years after 1960. Okay. And this one is going to be a concentration factor. So it increases the temperatures. I mean, I'm not going to say too much about sign because we don't identify sign. But this factor, uh, again, if it's multiply the, the most recent one, again, it's the very negative, and it's going to give us this yellow line. So it does make temperature to be more extreme. And then the last one explains only later, 2%. But I think it's interesting because it gives us asymmetry. Okay. But in a way that, and it is bumping up the hot and lowering the, the cooler, and it's becoming positive uh, in recent years. The, those are the things that you may. So I don't want to um, interpret too much, but it is so clear. Not always these functional principle components are interpretable, but I was surprised to see that this was so clearly interpretable. And this is what I said earlier, and that we can call this second one as outlier because it does give. When it's the most negatively affecting us, it's going to give us this uh, diverging dispersion. And the third one, it does uh, show, okay? Okay, so I know we are kind of running out of time, but so this mixed auto regression is the, the model. So it's, we're gonna have a two block, the vectoral regression for the user aggregate variable where we have this uh, global output, greenhouse gases and aerosols. And then the functional autoregression, which tells us dynamics of this functional variable, which is a globe demand, temporally demand, uh, temperature anomaly distribution. And we put them together as a vector together. And now the red one is infinite dimensional. So we do need to do something about it. So I'm gonna explain our methodology in a simple VR1 uh, setup. Of course, you can add more legs, just more complicated. There is nothing in sense. So uh, let's work on this first order. And later on in our system, uh, we, we go with the second order VAR, but I will illustrate with this. And this is going to be functional white noise error. And now, the extension of this theory here is that the, our functional the paper is originally developed with only when we have a functional variables. Now we extend to have it also aggregate variable so that the, the, we have to work with this extended uh, function space, which includes the three-dimensional, the user vector space, in addition to the Hilbert space that you would need to analyze these functions. So then things are different. So we our earlier paper deals with only this functional operator. And now we have the user three by three, the AR coefficient, but we also have an operator that maps function to a vector and the, the vector to functions. Okay. So once you the theory is really there, so you can have if you're interested in email me, I will send you the paper which uh, moves from the functional uh, autoregression to VAR. So as I said, you know, we have to do something about this infinite dimensional function to something finite. And the, if you have a, the basis, then you can always represent this. Uh, if it's a separable uh, function space, you can always have this representation. But the, for you to have equality, you have to have infinitely many bases, but we can. So we have to um, truncate at some point. So any functional, 
any of any study that does this functional approach will be doing something like they have to choose some basis and truncate some point. So we when we come up with we came up with this single framework that can we can encompass all the approaches that are available uh, out there. So uh, basically, I know I am we are out of time. So let me give you in a nutshell. So we're going to be approximating this and very important that what we do, even after we approximate, we have this important isometry so that the operation, the easy operation that we do in the vector space, we can, there is a one-to-one, -one, the isometry. So we can exactly transport what we have done to function space. So the, this is the isometry that we develop. So we can only look at the loadings and then at the end of the day, we can recover and we can do the same thing for the linear operator. And at the end of the day, once you have this isometry, then you can have this uh, finite dimensional VAR, which now include aggregate variables and the loadings. And then the here, instead of the operator, we're gonna have a matrix, okay? So in a big, in a nutshell, we start with the infinite dimensional mixed autoregression, but we project this, our, uh, our variable into the smaller space, say three-dimensional space we have, and then the rest. There, Nice thing about using our approach is that what's the other one that we're gonna leave out is orthogonal to what we are keeping. So not only it provides a good approximation, but even if we have a little bit of something that we're leaving out, it's not gonna affect what we do here, okay? And then finally, at the end of the day, you have approximate BAR, and we show that in our paper that this is valid approximations. And this isometry really help us recover this finite dimensional vector into the this uh, function space, okay? So the isometry is discussed and the choice of very, is very important. But first three is just an elementary because we, don't, we are not approximating aggregate variable. What's important is approximating function. And as I said, I'm going to use the functional principle components. And here we're gonna be using three. I mean, using functional principle component is not new as you guys know, but choice is going to be very different. So I'm going to evaluate. I'm going to use two more minutes to show you that this one is, uh, uh, I use this functional R square, which is basically comparing this the norm of the function after projecting onto this, say, three-dimensional space to the total variation. So the larger the functional R square means the more variation you are capturing by approximate your approximation. So therefore, the function is most uh, strongly and the all the parameters that we estimate are most strongly identified. And by definition of principal components, functional principal components, the functional R square of using function our basis is going to be the largest. And obviously, you can use any other basis and by including more uh, basis, you can increase functional R square, but you know that it comes with cost. So we, I'm going to compare uh, different approaches. One is based on moments, which use mean variance and so on. And another one is indicator basis, which is a histogram basis. They, they basically cut the intervals and take the average of in, in each interval. You can do it uniformly. That gives you histogram basis, but you can use based on quantiles and that will give you quantile basis. And this is functional R squares. And this is our principal component basis. You can see that as M gets large, our approach the R square increases much more quickly than the other bases that are commonly used. This moment basis is very, very slow. Even after 20, it's only 80. But in our approach with three, we only are already achieved 98%. But the variance is really increasing incredibly fast if you choose other bases. Compared to our approach, these are order of magnitude, much, much bigger. Okay. So, and then there is a persistency. So we have we do that to account for those patterns of persistency, the unit type. So we do ECM and we use, uh, we can perform this and estimate those. And then the estimate these parameters in our approximate BAR using these estimates that you compute from the Johansson's method, which can be also easily implemented in our setup. Okay, so um, Adriana, so I know it's over time. Uh, I, I can continue okay. and take questions along the way. Or yeah, so okay? thank you very much. I'm gonna stop the recording and then we can move to the to the chat if that's okay. Okay. And see you everyone uh, next year. <laughs>